Hi, everybody. Welcome again to another episode of the Shop Notes podcast. I'm your host, Phil Huber, on a special episode where it's just John and I, and we get to leave Logan behind a little bit, maybe talk behind his back. On today's episode, we'll discuss uh, learning some new skills and the routines that we have in the shop. I hope you enjoy listening. This episode of the Shop Notes podcast is brought to you by Shaper Tools makers of the Shaper Origin, the handheld CNC router that brings digital precision to the craft of woodworking. Tackle joinery, cabinetry, hardware installation, and more with speed and precision. You can try it risk-free in your shop for 30 days. Visit shapertools.com to learn more. Getting started today on the podcast, I thought I'd just let everybody know that you can watch the podcast on our YouTube channel. I know I often say that at the at the end, but I'm not sure how many people know that. Of course, our YouTube people who watch and comment will see that. But uh, also, if you would please rate and review the podcast wherever you listen, that helps us to get the word out and spread the podcast love with other folk. All right. All right. So here we so, are. Yeah, no, no Logan today. We get a little room to spread out a little bit more. <laughs> elbow room so but and we don't have to hear about sawmilling yeah <laughs> exactly so we will have to carry a little bit more weight though right I mean, he was a he shouldered a lot of the talking yes. as usual yeah. so it's gonna be tough but i think we can pull it off <laughs> logan is as we speak traveling to northwest iowa which is home to one of our TV show sponsors, Old Masters Finishing, which is part of the larger, what's their parent company now? Diamond Vogel. Diamond that Vogel, right? that's the mm -hmm. one. I always want to say another one and I'm not sure why, but yeah, he's going up there for a little uh, meeting with the Old Masters folk. So it'll be kind of fun to see what he comes back with. And then on Friday, when this episode drops, he and I will be taking a tour of the new Craig Tool facility that opened just north of the Des Moines proper in Ankeny. It's a pretty, pretty impressive looking building. Yeah. Nice location. Yeah. Closer to the metro. And I'm sure they got some pretty cool stuff and new state of the art building. So that'd be pretty excited to take a look at. Yeah. I, we got guidelines on what we need to do when we visit there. Like we can't take photos and Ooh. no secret cameras and that sort of thing. That makes you want to do it then. Right. It does. It's like You can't yeah. touch it. Now I want <laughs> yeah. to touch it. I want to touch it. So it'll be fun yeah. to see, see their new place. Cause I know they've been excited about it for the last few years as it's been under construction. Yeah. Yeah, some of the products that they've brought in that we've done some videos with, it's tough because it's like we're excited to to talk about it. It's like, nope, don't can't can't talk about can't it yet. About this it. isn't yep. this isn't out yet. Yeah. So just you know, hang in there. So it's coming. It's coming. So we were filming another episode of the TV show this week and getting an issue of the magazine out the door. So there's always that extra level of chaos, mm -hmm. which for some people, chaos is a vampire. And for others, it's the, it's the, it's the all you can eat buffet. That's right. You know, with four kids, I'm thriving on chaos. <laughs> that's, you know, that's my briar patch. Right. So throw me into it and I'm going to have a heyday. Yeah. Because more, more so that it just brings everybody else down to my level, <laughs> you know, levels the playing field. Yeah. Yeah. It is kind of interesting to see how different people react to deadline pressure. Mm -hmm. And some people get a little bit more anxious and antsy, more vocal. And other people, they just, it's tunnel vision. Yep. Get your head, yeah, exactly. put your head exactly. down, go at it. That's right. But somehow we always get it done. Yep. yep. We're always surprising ourselves. Right. So. So I know that in the last few issues, we've been changing up how we do our review process for articles. And you've been mm -hmm. called on to do more 
reading and commenting on articles? How's, how's that been? I really enjoy it because a lot of times I don't get to read the article before I've, you know, had to read these in the process. It's like, you know, I do my part of either designing a project or getting readers tips ready and it goes out the door and then a magazine gets printed. And if it doesn't get put on my desk, I, a lot of times I don't get to go back and read everything, but you know, when I'm put in that position that I get to read it as we go through it, it's, it's all, I'm always impressed with the, the project articles and how, um, you guys can kind of, you know, turn it into a story and kind of paint a picture of building this project in the shop. So it's kind of fun to, to see that and, you know, so, and then get to throw some, you know, critique bombs at, at everybody once in a while too. So, <laughs> you know, it's a good gig. Yeah. I mean, cause so. normally as a project designer, our f workflow has been in a first round of proofing that as the designer, you're going through and checking, but you're mostly looking for numbers, making sure that they're mm -hmm. consistent and coherent and accurate. Right. Yes. Which is the, which is the, the big thing that we really strive for is that the numbers are what matter Yeah. When building a project and, and everything else is kind of ancillary. So, but yeah, my, I was reading some articles this weekend and my kids are like, why are you doing copy editing? And it's like, well, there's only a couple editors. So somebody <laughs> and everybody's pretty much looking at every article now. So yeah, it's like, you know, I got to do some drawings with crayons on it too. Yep. So proverbially speaking, yeah, cause it's cause... all done digitally. Now we share it in Adobe rather than passing around the sheets and marking it up in different colors and initials and which yeah. has been a process to learn over the last couple of years. So, yeah, that was something that the pandemic forced on us was having to go from a very analog way of editing where we would print out two page spreads at a time and pass them around and try and mm -hmm. keep track of them to being digital now. Yeah. Hey, the big problem used to be is like, okay, whose desk did that get stuck on? And where is it at? Now it's okay. Who left the file open so we can't get in? <laughs> so then there's all these messages going around on the computer and calling people out and, mm -hmm. you know, just general shaming. Right. Yeah. So it goes with the but, chaos. Right. So, but yeah, so it's been kind of a fun new thing to do. So, yeah. Then the episode that we're working on this week is we're doing clocks. Uh, several years ago, I hate to wonder how many years ago now, we did a, a craftsman style clock on the TV show. And I thought, you know, a clock is a relatively small, simple project that we could do three of them that Chris and Logan and I could each make a different clock and kind of make it our own and then pull out for the show, what are kind of the interesting, unique features of it. I think a part of what's interesting is the individual clocks that we picked out mm -hmm. and how they either do or don't match our personalities. Yeah. Yeah. They're definitely, it's like, oh, a clock is a clock. Like how different they, can they be? And they're, you know, three very different designs and materials and so it's kind of cool to see what you guys came up with. Yeah. So uh, just a little teaser for season 16 for everybody. Chris did a wall mounted sunburst clock that was featured in popular woodworking a number of years ago. And since we have that catalog available to us, we were able to pull that out and, mm -hmm. and as usual, Chris was amazing with it. Yep. His pile of parts that he prepared to get ready for filming today looked better than a lot of my finished projects, I feel like, just because yes. he he had everything very tidily put together, a couple of table saw sleds and jigs, some drill press things. and Yeah. Yeah, as much as we should have a Logan bashing podcast, we could just as easily have a Chris Fitch appreciation uh, <laughs> podcast because 
not I mean he's pretty quiet and behind like you know not doesn't really seek the spotlight but he is like the Chuck Norris of Woodsmith he's just legendary and you could go on and on about his accomplishments and the things he does so yeah for instance yeah he was cutting uh, for the sunburst clock he had to cut a you know perfect circle on the bandsaw and I think Becky's like don't you want a circle cutting jig and he's like no I think I can do it and he just by hand first shot cut a perfect circle barely needed needed sanding and just like he's like i don't really need a, a jig i can do it it's just like that's chris yeah it was i mean he does stuff regularly that is amazing but that particular one i mean because he's kind of a bandsaw master which mm -hmm. i you don't really get that from chris most of the time or in general just because a lot of our furniture projects are pretty table saw dependent and that's kind of what people are used to or whatever. But Chris just walks up to that thing. And like you said, like this was the hub was what eight quarter cherry. Mm -hmm. And he had scribed out a circle with a compass and just cut to the line like NBD. Yep. yep. He's like, it's like watching a sports car going down the, you know, coastal highways of California, just kind of like come <laughs> hugging the curves here and cruising right along. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, which kind of brought me to what I wanted to talk about primarily as the topic of today's podcast was acquiring skills in woodworking. Cause a lot of the, you know, that's, and I think it also came up with doing a lot of the proofreading for the episode or not the episode for the issue that just went out is you know, we try to emphasize the fact that even though a project looks complex, our goal as the designers and the writers and the illustrators is to show the smaller, relatively simple, to use a word that we try to not overuse, steps. And if you put those together, you're going to end up with a nice looking piece. Mm -hmm. And because I was thinking, like, how do you get good at cutting a perfect circle on the bandsaw? Like, right. Like, you just line up pieces and start cutting circles start. until you get it. Because it's like, how often do you need to cut a circle? You do it and then you walk away. And yeah. then the next time you do it. So it's like, how do you get right. good at it? Yeah. So just because in comparison, um, I, you know, like a lot of people, I enjoy grilling when the weather is nice and when it's a gray February day, like it is today, it's very easy to think about how nice it would be to grill when you can't, mm -hmm. but, and I can grill, I'm from Wisconsin. So genetically I know how to grill a brat. That's just geese fly North and South at the right season, Wisconsinites grill brats. Mm -hmm. Um, and I can do hamburgers, all that kind of stuff. When it comes to like steaks, I, I have no idea. I can very easily make terrible steaks. Right. And the problem is, is that it ends up being expensive, but it's like, how do you practice, get better at cooking, grilling steaks, you grill steaks. So you, we just don't have them all that often. So it's like mm -hmm. twice a year, I get to show my ineptitude. It's like, I didn't burn it this time, kids. Yay. <laughs> it is, however, very raw on the inside. So <laughs> burnt on the outside and bloody in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty so, hard to do. So it's like woodworking, I feel like. And I think that's something that, you know, we're enthusiastic about the craft and want to communicate that enthusiasm, you know, because I think it's kind of a buzzkill if you would just start off a project like, look at how awesome this project is. It's way above your head and it's super complex and it's going to take a lot of time to do. Mm -hmm. Go. Yeah. So I think we can sometimes in our enthusiasm be guilty of underselling the complexity of it, but I think there's something to be said about practicing or looking at learning new skills as a learning 
process rather than like, I'm just going to step up to the table saw and make really accurate cross cuts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it, it definitely helps if you're an amateur woodworker, not to always just jump into a big, big project that has lots of different techniques and can kind of be overwhelming and, you know, you're not good at it until the end and it might work out better if you can find small projects that, that you can batch out and right. make small, you know, bandsaw projects or something smaller that has the joinery that you want, like dovetailing, you know, small boxes or small uh, boxes with box joints. So you can do lots of practicing on and do smaller projects that aren't so overwhelming and you can get lots of practice that way, I guess. But yeah, I also think the, an error isn't going to cost you as much on a smaller project mm -hmm. like it would on say a larger case piece. You know, if you have to remake a small box side or something like that, which I guess is why I like the clock idea, you know, for an ep TV episode is they're each relatively small projects, but they kind of focus on a specific technique or a couple of techniques, you know, like Logan's is a uh, simple joinery, but the, the eye catching part of it is an art glass stained glass piece that he has for it. You know, Chris's was about, uh, making these sunburst rays with a couple of table saw jigs. Well, basically one table saw jig and how you position parts and make, make multiple identical parts, which was kind of cool. Mm -hmm. You know, and the one that I did with router made finger joints. So it's just being able to, I don't know, because I was thinking about it because it's a lot of times I'll read or see something that I really am excited about doing and I enjoy reading a lot and learn a lot from it, but there's something about connecting that reading and then immediately doing it that kind of locks it into my head, even if I mm -hmm. kind of mess up on it, like it's just you start to build different levels of understanding of a woodworking process. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely like any other hobby, like golf or anything like that, where it's easy to get frustrated and just not want to try it again, but just kind of do it, practice it, you know, gets better each time. And by the end you got, you're a pretty good woodworker. Yeah. Good enough. <laughs> so yeah the other thing with boxes i mean that's a good thing because like you just start with a really big box and if you don't like the way the joint worked out you make it smaller and smaller until you have you know cut those joints off and then you have a tiny box at the end mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so i did know. i did something very similar to that at the start of the pandemic when my kids were transitioning from being at school to being at home and we needed a place for them to keep school books and their laptops and stuff like that close by where we had set up our, you know, study station or whatever. So I built a, uh, like a plywood open box or open cabinet. So the back, there wasn't really no back on it and, uh, made a cool looking Japanese inspired sled base on it. And as I was cutting the corner joints, I noticed that my ends of the pieces weren't as square as I wanted them to be. And it was when I did like a dry assembly, it kind of twisted on me. And mm -hmm. when I ferreted it out, the reason for it, it was that it wasn't quite square. So like, that's not a big deal. All I got to do is just trim up the ends. Right. But in trimming up the ends, by the time I assembled it, you know, the kids had, you know, three ring binder kind of things that had to fit on these shelves and I had designed it. So I had plenty of leeway, but in the process of getting it fit, by the time I had it all assembled and painted, like you could just barely <laughs> squeeze that on there. Then you had to take the binders out to the belt sander and take a little bit off and yeah, yeah, it fits. Yeah, it fits. You're just not putting it in right. Right. 
So yes. kind of lesson learned on that one. Yeah. I've made a silverware drawer organizer that way where got all done and it's like, uh, it's not quite fitting the silverware here. <laughs> so just takes practice. Yep. It does. It's kind of funny that way. Mm -hmm. I think the other part of it, it is because the Olympics are going on right now, the Winter Olympics, and it's always interesting to see the different competitors as they prepare for their event, the kind of routines that they do to get ready. You know, and then, of course, you have your human interest stories on a couple of them where they go into some long backstory of practicing their sport since they were three years old and whatever, and all the practice time. And there is a ton of practice time that goes into it, but I'm thinking it would be interesting to think about like, what are the routines for like going into your shop to get started? Like not just going in there and just jumping into a project, but you know, maybe you spend a few minutes like reviewing where you are in a given project or making a couple of test cuts or, you know, double checking, mm -hmm fences and blade angles and things like that. Oh yeah. Always double check the fences. <laughs> <laughs> I've done that. I've walked into the shop and cut something and like, oh, they like had the table at a 2%, you know, bev or angle on the bandsaw or the blades tilted five degrees. And I'm just going in there to make, try to make square rips. And <laughs> it's like, oh, well, now we're going to have a smaller box. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Cause I did that just yesterday getting ready for my segment. Logan had been in there and cut his, the sides on his clock. And because his clock has l angled sides, he had cut beveled ends on the mm -hmm. ends of his piece. And it wasn't hardly anything two degrees or three degrees or whatever. And I needed to cut some backer strips for a router jig. So I just went in there, set the rip fence, made a couple of cuts. And then all of a sudden I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> yep. That's one of the things with the shared shop, but yeah, I've done it at home too, or cut something at an angle real quick and walked away and come back days later. And, oh yeah, I forgot that I set that at an angle. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. My shop is a shared shop and. I share it with myself and I do a terrible job of preparing <laughs> it for the next guy. Yeah. Yeah. It always helps too to sharpen tools and yeah. before you get started. That's one thing I, I guess is practicing. We're talking about trying to get the best results as a woodworker. It's so much easier with sharp tools and than, than dull tools. Right. But. No, I've noticed that and it's, because I've been trying to do more with my hand planes and I have one here from my home shop and it needs to be sharpened, but you just keep thinking, well, I just got to quick get this done and mm -hmm. then I can sharpen it tomorrow or after this episode or something like that. And it's, nope, it's time to sharpen it. Let's be done with it. And also with finishing. Because the clock that I made for my wife for Christmas, that one that I showed off a couple of weeks ago, I tried to be much more deliberate in the finishing process to, because it's a small project, you notice the finish more. And so I took time to be methodical about sanding all the parts. And, you know, cleaning up glue squeeze out or making sure surfaces are flat and level and chamfers stay kind of crisp looking and all that kind of stuff. So that when I was going through the finishing process and I ended up doing like four coats of uh, wiping varnish on it, you know, sanding between coats and making sure that you're not putting on too much and that kind of thing. And it ended up turning out really nice. And it was one of my mm -hmm. better looking pieces because of being methodical on it and not trying to, or not assuming that I knew 
what I was doing and just end up rushing through something, but being a little bit more observant as to what was actually happening. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing on, on finishing what the difference it makes of when you just kind of taking your time and being really deliberate versus usually I'm in the spray booth and it's like, how quickly can I get three coats of lacquer on this? And then <laughs> you end up getting runs cause you put it on too thick or, you know, you end up sanding a kind of a wet or soft spot and then you're going back and trying to fix that. And yeah. So yeah, it's amazing. So what else do you have going on? Oh, I don't know. Got the show. You mentioned that and wrapping up this issue. So, um, right now I'm trying to, for the next issue, I guess that's right around the corner now. So, uh, uh, working on designing a bathroom vanity, which is kind of a challenge just because it's such a vague, like here, bathroom vanity. Well, is it a two sink vanity? Is it one sink? Is it, right? you know, if you try to narrow it down to styles, then, you know, you have to start considering plumbing where plumbing's going and, and that kind of thing versus just, you know, just a piece of furniture. You can kind of do whatever. So, yeah working on getting that drawn up because shop guys are going to be waiting for that shortly. You know, yeah. kind of keep an eye on, on their projects that they're building. It's like, oh, how much time do I have <laughs> before they're, you know, in the finish room and with their project and waiting on the next thing. And yeah, so, but so that's, it's one thing that I'm trying to get done sooner rather than later, but yeah. What I think is kind of interesting when we planned this as a project is how much of like a crossover project a vanity is because it's sort of like furniture, but it's also kind of a built in piece mm -hmm. part of your house. You know, a lot of furniture projects just kind of are, you know, a bookshelf, bookshelf or a bookcase just is it holds books or whatever, you know, whereas when we do shop projects, they usually have to do something. So they have to have a function to it, an active function. And that's kind of this case too, where it's kind of like furniture, but like you said, it also has to function in the sense that it has to accommodate the, the plumbing and it has to accommodate the dad or the mom that has to crawl inside of it and connect all the faucets and water lines and not feel yeah. like a contortionist. Yeah. That's definitely part of the consideration is like not closing it in too much because yeah, you got to get hands in there to connect things or disconnect things. And, um, it's like how, like with, with furniture, it's like, you know, it's going to get moved around. So I gotta, you know, make it sturdy and all that but like with the vanity it's getting attached to a wall um you may or may not need a back to it or a top to it because you have the wall and you have a sink that's going on top and you know how that's all going to get connected so it's just a little bit different it yeah. looks like furniture but yeah it's got to have some different accommodations yeah so what what's the look that you're going with now um uh, it's, it's kind of the, uh, Prairie trail soccer mom look that I've kind of been stuck on All right, for the, for the listeners that, that don't know, we just moved to sub, uh, suburbia of Des Moines, suburb, <laughs> suburb of Des Moines, where it's very much kind of, I don't know, pottery barn, would you say? <laughs> yes. So that's kind of the vibe that I've been feeling lately. Yeah. So with that, the bench that I had in this, this current issue. And so I don't know, it's, it's kind of a modern country, I guess. Is mm -hmm. that more PC? Sure. Yeah. Like a relaxed suburbia soccer mom, relaxed, traditional. Yeah. You know, business casual <laughs> jeans and a nice shirt, yeah. I guess. Mm -hmm. so, okay. That makes sense. That's the vibe I'm going with. All right. Just a drop-in countertop sink, or not, uh, you're not doing yeah. some wacky vessel thing? No, I don't know. Just they, they look nice, but just with having kids and stuff, it's like that's I just don't get that vibe because I know 
I want it to be usable, right? Type thing, and not just like look nice and yeah, that kind of thing. So it's the sink that I was going with is kind of you know kind of a drop in, you know, kind of country style, not like a full like you know country like the tall no sinks, like an apron sink or something yeah, like that. Apron yeah, apron sink or anything like that. So I don't know. Keeping it simple. Okay. Usable. Nice. Mm-hmm. So now I gotta back it up and get that done. <laughs> <laughs> well the best part is is that yeah. people will be able to keep track of that on our Facebook lives that we do on Thursdays. So Yes. Yeah. So tune in be coming to the shop soon yeah how about you what do you got going on well i've been trying to finish some projects because uh like i said i've been and apparently i have a reputation around here for gathering up the the island of misfit project mm -hmm. parts and yes you are the take care of the orphaned <laughs> prop parts <laughs> give them a home Right, which is why I don't go to the Animal Rescue League because otherwise we would have 45 dogs and whatever mm -hmm. just because it would be like, they need rescuing. <laughs> but yeah, I just, uh, well, I wrapped up that clock project and I feel like I just finished something else now too and I can't think of it. Yeah, what was that? Yeah, the clock and, oh, you got the double door box that you're kind of yeah. like getting close. Yep. Uh, so I'm doing a box for video edition. Um, also have a toolbox project that I started. So I think that I talked about that last week of when you can't do woodworking, just start doing more woodworking because mm -hmm. that's always the best, best option. So um, I also have a, Chris did a canister project a few years ago and we showed it on the TV show as well, where it was, you make a, like a staved canister of different sizes and heights, and then using a router to basically turn it round. And then he had a threading jig that he made for cutting threads on the inside on it. And then, excuse me, on the lid of it. And, uh, so he had one of his prototype canisters just kind of kicking around and I found it, it was made out of poplar. So and I wanted to do something a little bit different with it. So I've been working on it with, uh, kind of in a carved, uh, Dave Fisher style to make it into like a canister thing that we could put coffee in for in the studio. So, oh, and I remember the other project was a tool tote for my cordless Dremel. Oh, yeah. That was the yeah, one that, that I had finished. Mm -hmm. um, again, that was from Misfit Parts, Chris's CNC Base Camp web show that he's been doing. He did one both on there and for the TV show where he made out of quarter inch plywood kind of a tab and slot construction for a tool tote that we showed how to do the old fashioned way with a router table way back in shop notes. But he cut out all the parts on the CNC. And then you just kind of fit them together. Well, I have a, a a Dremel, cordless Dremel that I got. And it's just in, you know, the injection or blow molded plastic case. And it kind of looks dumb. And I wanted something that looked a little nicer. So I took those parts for the toolbox, shrunk it down to about two thirds of its size. And then uh, created some new holders for the cordless Dremel and for the bits and accessories that go with it and then painted it some fun colors and uh, my daughter's going to make some stickers to go with it and because quite a number of us here at woodsmith for better or for worse are star wars nerds i did uh yes <laughs> john's got a star wars shirt on for all the people who yep. are watching on the radio yep um i did it in the colors of ahsoka tano's company from the 501st clone battalion. So it was kind of fun. So it'll be nice to see the stickers on that. Cool. Anyway, I mean, if you're going to build something for your workshop, might as well have some fun with it. Yep. Personalize it and yeah. make it look nice. Yeah. Which I kind of like, you know, cause I think for the most part, 
most of the cases that tools come in are designed simply for the wow factor of opening it up and aren't very practical at all for right. using that tool long term. Yeah. I don't think any of those cases were designed for the cord being on the tool. <laughs> like they designed it around the 3D model of the tool and then at, they got it all done. It's like, oh, wait, there's a cord on this thing. And then yeah. it's like impossible to like close it back up once you've taken it out originally with the cord. And you're just kind of like shoving it into the edges as you're smashing down the <laughs> the lid of the box. And so. Right. Yeah. So and I just like surrounding myself with things that I've made and kind of as an antidote to. I don't know, a manufactured world, I guess. Yeah. In the Makes same sense. way that I like cooking instead of just eating prepared foods or something. So anyway, so those are the projects that I have going on right now. And I'm looking forward to, we've had kind of a few warm days here in Iowa, which makes mm -hmm. me excited about being outside in my shop and spending some time out there again. Uh, mm -hmm. My dad, if he's listening, um, he's getting outed right now because they're going to be moving to a different house in about a month or so. So I've been trading texts and phone calls with him about going from the house he they have now, his shop is out in the garage, which has all the benefits and downsides of being out in the garage. And his new house will have the shop in the basement. So nice. he's also taking the opportunity to purge stuff because mm -hmm. I apparently got that from him on collecting things and finding useful things, even though you may not ever use them. Cool. Nice little upgrade for him and yeah. Get a yeah. Redo the shop. Yeah. Like you will get to do in a couple of months. I know. Yep. Once we get past false spring and second winter and <laughs> we'll have seven good days before we're in the sweltering heat of the summer and right. right off we go yeah maybe over spring break Who maybe knows? maybe <laughs> so so for everybody listening i'd like to know what you have as developed shop routines or what kind of things do you do to make a prod or a technique, a woodworking technique ingrained? Do you just continue to use that on project after project? Or do you take time to practice? Like when you just get a few moments to steal away to go out to your workshop, do you just work on a specific set of techniques? Um, what are the things that trip you up? Those are, those are my discussion questions for today. And I'd love to hear from you if you want to send those in an email woodsmith at woodsmith.com. You can also write them in the comment section on our YouTube channel. Uh, otherwise, I uh, just want to remind you today's episode is brought to you by Shaper Tools. And they're the makers of the Shaper Origin. And I'm sure you've seen it. It's that handheld CNC. It looks like, a, looks like uh, the offspring of R2-D2 and your router. And it brings digital precision to your woodworking. You can do all kinds of stuff with it. Joinery, hardware installation, cabinetry construction. It's all with speed and precision. And they have a risk-free trial period where you can have the Shaper in your shop for 30 days. If you're interested in learning more about it, just check out their website. It's shapertools.com. Thanks, everybody, listening to today's episode of the Shop Notes Project. And we'll see you again next week. Bye, everybody.